This evening, and let us begin with our with our theme: the origin of the Pharisees, the history of the Pharisees, and uh, the Pharisees in the view of the Christians throughout the the ages. The history of the Jewish people can be divided into many stages some of which were marked by periods of great spiritual creativity. Perhaps that is the reason for the durability of the Jewish people for millennia. The Jews of today see themselves as the successors of the spirituality of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of Moses and the prophets, of the sages of the Talmud and of the Middle Ages, of the teachers of the Enlightenment and of the Hasidic rabbis. The Talmud tells a story in which the soul of Moses visits a class about the Torah being taught by the great Rabbi Akiva, who lived in the first and second century of uh, the common era. At first, Moses despaired because he who after all had been given the Torah by God on Mount Sinai did not understand anything they were saying about it. Then a student asked Rabbi Akiva where a certain teaching came from to which the sage replied this is a teaching of Moses at Sinai. Then Moses felt better although he knew the law under discussion was not in the written Torah. He saw the interpretations of his, teaching, of his teachings were evolving over time. Similarly, if Moses were to somehow suddenly appear in the present, he would still recognize that today's Jewish teachings even though not literally composed by himself, remained in continuity with God's revelation at Sinai. This distinction between the written Torah and the interpreted or oral Torah appears to have been a core precept of a group of ancient Jews known as the Perushim, in Hebrew, or Pharisees, the Anglicized form from uh, the Greek Phariseos, uh, which is an adaptation to the Greek from Perushi. Their distant origins may go all the way back to the Babylonian exile. This was when the Babylonians in 586, before this coming era, demolished Solomon's temple in Jerusalem and took the leaders of Judea into captivity in Babylon. The exiles came to learn that they could preserve their identity as Jews by creating a spirituality centered on the written scriptures. The written text thus took the place of the destroyed temple as the place of encounter with God. After their exile ended, some Jews returned to Israel and built a second temple. The high priestly family descended from Tzadok, King David's high priest centuries earlier, were the authoritative leaders of the new temple. But now the temple was not unrevealed as the source of holiness. The scriptures and those scribes who interpreted them according to emerging oral traditions also had authority. 
they, for example, established weekly readings of Torah passages which were studied and discussed. We see evidence of this kind of scribal activity on the end of the 5th century or at the beginning of the 4th century before Christ's era. From Nehemiah, Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8, we learn of Ezra's work to interpret the Torah for the whole people. It seems that Ezra's interpretative movement had opposition from the aristocrat priestly classes, which had different interests and spiritual perspectives. The Tzadokit priests in particular may have represented a conservative viewpoint that wanted to restrict holiness to the temple and to written texts and sought to deny legit legitimacy to scribes who use oral traditions of interpretation. Perhaps they even called such scribes perushim, the separated or departed ones, because of their deviation from the, main, from the mainstream. In Greek, perushim, as I said, becomes Pharisees, and the descendants of Tzadok, the great priest, became Sadducees names that appear in the New Testament. It may be that the competition between the Sadducees and the Pharisees has its distant roots as far back as the decades after the return of the exiles from Babylon. Be that as it may, by the second century uh, before coming era, the Pharisees and Sadducees are named as identifiable groups. Josephus mentions them in Antiquities, in a famous book, in his accounts of Jonathan the Hasmonean, probably because by then they were already well-differentiated movements. The Pharisees were not priests. They were devoted to the public and obliga obliga obligatory study of the Torah, a social order that emphasized help to the needy respect for women, the practice of ritual purity at their fellowship meals, even when distant from the temple. The scrolls of the Dead Sea and the Jewish Apocrypha, especially the books of Enoch and Jubilees, reveal the great spiritual ferment that took place in Judea of the second and first century eh, before coming era. Josephus mentions the essence sect and the Talmud mentions other groups. Eschatological attitudes were fairly, fairly widespread, meaning that many Jewish groups were expecting that God would intervene in history very soon to establish divine rule and restore self-rule to Israel. Rabbinic texts from the second century Christi's, Christian era onward also mentions the Perushim, for instance, in the Tractate of Kedushin, uh, page 66, the wise men of the Torah are identified with the Pharisees. But, uh, this is a great but, in Sota 21a and 22b, Perushin is used to label people who hypocritically manifested a false religiosity. They used in another way the word Perushin. Having said all this, it is impossible to describe in precise, in precise detail the beliefs and practices of the Pharisees who appear in the New Testament, in the New Testament Gospels. In the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke appear forceful, sometimes polemical disputes between Jesus and Pharisees. Behind this narrative, written decades after the lifetime of Jesus are probably typical first century Jewish debates about the proper interpretation of the mitzvot, the precepts, or Torah commandments. All the participants are concerned how to behave with holiness and goodness in life. The point that must be stressed is that nowhere in the New Testament is Jesus portrayed as denying the importance of the Torah or its interpretation. In fact, unlike the Sadducees, Jesus is depicted as teaching that the Torah needed to be interpreted. 
Such conversations were typical at the time. For instance, the Talmud re repeatedly notes the different halachic or legal interpretations of Hillel and Shammai, who are often understood to be Pharisees and were two older contemporaries of Jesus. If the New Testament presents Jesus as frequently debating with Pharisees, it is probably because they shared so many ideas in common. In particular, they both seem to have been more centered on the Torah than the Temple. And now, Christian traditions about Pharisees. So, thank you. Um, so, as Rabbi Skorka said, by the time of Jesus, first century of the Common Era, uh, the Pharisees were an identifiable group of scribes, meaning they could read and write, they were literate, uh, who studied the Torah according to oral traditions that they traced as far back as they could, and tried to make all life as holy as if someone were entering the temple to pray. So being ritually pure was important to them, uh, observing the Torah mitzvot, the commandments was important to them, and they sought to make um, the Torah commands easy for the ordinary people to follow. They were very creative in how they interpreted the Torah, so much so that some of the people by the Dead Sea at Qumran called them the seekers after smooth things, by which they did not mean a compliment. Now, so this is the world of, uh, into which Jesus is born, and it is a world that's in great ferment in the land of Israel because of the overpowering presence of the Roman Empire. And all Jews are discussing how do we live out God's will, God's commands, under Roman supervision or Roman dominance. And of course, there's different groups that have different opinions and so forth and so on. So Jesus comes along as a, uh, Rabbi Skorka mentioned, um, eschatological ideas or apocalyptic ideas, which is the notion that God is gonna intervene soon to clean up this mess. The world is not the way it's supposed to be. Israel is not supposed to be subjected to pagan empires, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Jesus comes along with that same message. His way of putting it is the reign of God is near. Get ready for it. It's gonna be wonderful. And he has meals all over the place as an anticipation of a great banquet when the reign of God, or Olam Haba, if you will, is fully uh, present and active in the world. Unfortunately, that message gets him killed. Romans are not interested in hearing about the coming of the God of Israel in power, because if that were to happen, who loses power? Uh, it's pretty obvious. And the Romans had a particular way of dealing with seditionists. They crucified them, like tens of thousands of other Jews. That is the fate that Jesus met. So um, in the process of him making these announcements, we know that he interacted with different opinions in the Jewish community of the late Second Temple period. Sometimes he agreed with what some people were saying, other times he disagreed or agreed with what other people were saying, and this is typical of the discourse in the Jewish world of the late Second Temple period. Jesus is part of the conversation, in other words. But as you know, the word Pharisee later took on a negative connotation. Um, becoming equivalent to the word hypocrite in the typical dictionaries. If you look up the word Pharisee, you will see some words to that effect. So what I would like to um, explore is how is it that a group that, as Rabbi Skorka said, the Pharisees were probably very close to Jesus in many of their ideas. They both felt, this was a primary point you made, they both felt the Torah had to be interpreted. You just couldn't simply read it and enact it. Um, as all Jews in the room know, the interpretation is key. Um, so how did, it be, how did it pick up a negative cast? I also need to mention that a particular Pharisee, we, we, by the way, I don't think we have any writings from any source 
that is signed by, I am so-and-so a Pharisee. You know, we, we just don't have it. We wish we did, with one exception. The letters of Paul in the New Testament are written by somebody who self-identifies as a Pharisee. And he's proud of it, despite some later Christian interpretations to the contrary. Paul comes to believe that the end of days is really near, that what Jesus said was correct. And the reason he comes to that conviction is because he has come to believe that the one that was crucified has been raised into the life of the new age. And so he goes around, and here I, I think he does this precisely because he's a Pharisee. He runs around trying to bring as many Gentiles into a relationship with the God of Israel because that's what's supposed to happen at the end of days. Remember Isaiah and Micah, all the nations will come to Jerusalem to learn the name of the Lord and to walk in his paths. Well, if you'll pardon the anachronistic reference to Islam here, uh, in Paul's case, if the people aren't going to the mountain, then the mountain will come to the people. And that's what Paul is doing. He's trying to turn pagans from idolatry to walk in the ways of the God of Israel, but not becoming Jews in the process. But what I want to underscore is I think he does that precisely because he's a Pharisee. He wants to spread holiness in the world, which is what the Pharisees wanted to do. Now, as you all know, the Second Temple gets destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 CE. Well, after that happens, um, the situation for both Jews who follow Jesus, the raised and crucified and raised one, and other Jews is thrown into upheaval. Who is going to lead the Jewish community in a world without the temple? I hasten to add, they didn't know the temple wouldn't be rebuilt. A lot of Jews thought maybe in 70 years the second temple would be rebuilt as a third temple because that's what had happened back with the Babylonian exile. About 70 years went by and they built the second temple. But nonetheless, it turns out that the two Jewish groups that were the most pliant, the most adaptable, the ones best able to deal with the new situation of a Jewish world without the temple as the place where sacrifices could be offered, turn out to be the followers of Jesus and the Pharisees. The Pharisees because they were already trying to make life holy as if one were in the temple but were not physically there. So once there is no temple physically there, they're kind of halfway along the road of finding holiness through other sources, such as the, the, the interpretations of the Torah, such as observing many of the prayers in the home rather than in the shrine of the temple, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, the Christian, I can now start using that word without being anachronistic, the Christian response to the destruction of the temple is to emphasize that the one who was crucified, his sacrifice takes the place of the sacrifices that now no longer can occur in the temple. And in fact, by being raised, he has entered the heavenly temple and is seated with the Father and is able to pray directly to the Holy One of Israel. And it makes sense given the, the circumstances. So this is the beginning of a very different understanding of the Pharisees of all people because what happens is at the time the New Testament Gospels are written, which is post-70, the writers of the Gospels are frequently in competition with Pharisees for influence in the Jewish world in which the priests no longer have any real influence because there's no temple anymore. And in the case in particular of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew is the Gospel that presents Jesus as the one who interprets Torah definitively, the Sermon on the Mount is in a sense Jesus like a new Moses presenting the definitive interpretation of the Torah. But Matthew doesn't want his community to be following the teachings of the Pharisees who don't have any interest in the teachings of Jesus or his way of interpreting. So if you look at your handout, there's a handout that says some illustrative quotations from antiquity. Let me just read through it quickly. And this is excerpted. It's, there's a whole chapter that goes on in this vein. Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples saying, the scribes and the Pharisees have taken their seat on the chair of Moses. Therefore, do and observe whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example. Because they preach, but they don't practice. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on people's shoulders, but they won't lift a finger to help move them. 
All their works are performed to be seen. They widen their phylacteries, their, their prayer shawls, and lengthen their tassels. They love places of honor at banquets, seats of honor in synagogues, greetings in marketplaces, and the salutation rabbi. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. This is all on the lips of Jesus. You hypocrites, blind guides who strain out the gnat and swallow the camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You cleanse the outside of a cup and a dish, but inside they're full of plunder and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, cleanse first the inside of the cup so that the outside may also be clean. Now these are all halakhic topics being disputed. How do you know that a cup is ritually pure and purity was a big importance for the Pharisees and for Jesus, but they understood how purity happened or was preserved in different ways? Um, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are, the white, you are like white, whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones and every kind of filth. On the outside, you look good, but inside you're filled with hypocrisy and evil doing. Okay, you get the idea. But I want to underscore that Matthew is competing with these people and he probably realizes he's losing the struggle for influence in the post-temple Jewish world. But this is the kind of rhetoric that people used in the first century when they were arguing with one another and we can find similar kinds of, of verbiage in other inner Jewish disputes like between Josephus and the Zealots and so Josephus has nice things to say about the Egyptians and anyway, this is the rhetoric of, this, of the time. Now, the New Testament also has some positive things, but the later Christian tradition pulls out the negative depictions of the Pharisees for a reason I will explain. But just look at quote two there on that same page. One of the uh, scribes, in, this is from Mark's gospel, in Matthew this individual is identified as a Pharisee, so let's make him one. He came forward and heard uh, them, Jesus and other folks, disputing and saw how well Jesus had answered them. He asked him, which is the greatest commandment? Jesus replied, the first is, something very familiar, Shema Yisrael, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now this is, of course, a combination of Deuteronomy 6.4 and Leviticus 19.18. There is no other commandment, goes the mark in Jesus here, greater than these. The scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you are right in saying he is one and there is no other than he. And to love him with all your heart and all your understanding and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is worth more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Notice that's a... And um, and time might be a little strong, but it's, it's, it's not a pro-temple perspective that this scribe is speaking. It's a pro, the Torah must be interpreted uh, perspective. And when Jesus saw that the guy answered with understanding, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. That's pretty high praise coming from Jesus. And no one dared to ask him any more questions. So you see, there's a conversation between Jesus and a Pharisee that's really rather friendly. But that's not the kind of text that's remembered in the later Christian tradition, is, is my point. Look at number three, to just to be complete here. This is from Luke. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, get out of here and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. This is Herod Antipas who beheaded John the Baptist, so he's got a record of you know, killing people he doesn't like. Um, but again, you see Pharisees portrayed as warning Jesus, uh, watch out, you know, your, your, your days are numbered. Now, um, you can read number five, which talks about Nicodemus, a Pharisee, only appears in the Gospel of John. It's kind of positive, but it's also Jesus is encountered under the cover of darkness, and it's a little bit of an ambivalent presentation. But here's my point. By the time the New Testament is written, let's say by the year 110 or so CE, the latest New Testament books are composed, by this time, the church is becoming a separate, distinct religious identity. And they are subject to periodic persecution by the Roman Empire. Why? Well, they're kind of weird from a Roman point of view. They talk about worshiping a guy that was crucified. And they have a meal that they talk about his body and blood being involved. Well, that's okay. That seems odd from a Roman pagan point of view. And um, in addition, 
the Roman pagan intelligentsia are really baffled by the fact that Christians say that God gave the Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai, but they don't follow that Torah. You see the problem? So, you know, if, I, if you were a Christian in that time period and I was, there was a guy named Celsus, a Roman uh, intellectual, a pagan, said, look, you're saying that, the word, that God gave these commandments, yet you're ignoring them. How do you figure that out? And of course, the Christian response has to draw on Old Testament texts, which everybody knows are Jewish texts, in order to explain why they understand the text of the, whole, of the Hebrew Bible better than Jews do who can speak Hebrew and the Christians don't. It's a real challenging thing. So you've got to delegitimize the, the authority of Judaism in the Roman world, and you resort to name calling, something that we're all too accustomed with in our political discourse today, dare I say. And so look at number six. This is from Gregory of Nyssa. This is in the fourth century. I have to take a deep breath in order to say this all at once, but here I go. Jews are slayers of the Lord, murderers of the prophets, enemies of God, haters of God, adversaries of grace, enemies of their father's faith, advocates of the devil, brood of vipers, slanderers, scoffers, men of darkened minds, can't do it, leaven of the Pharisees, congregation of demons, sinners, wicked men, stoners, and haters of goodness. Well, that kind of covers a lot of territory, but you'll see it's they're in an adversarial position. And, and in fact, Christianity is not a legal religion, but Judaism is. And so there's a whole social influence disparity, social prestige disparity going on here. But it's, and here's the, the key takeaway that I want to indicate. The Pharisees come to be the representation, the symbols of everything that Christians find wrong with Judaism. And you see them woven in, in the passage. I mean, I could, there's hundreds of these passages from all kinds of writers in the first few centuries of the Christian era. Um, They've, the, it has come to be believed in Christianity of the time that in order for Christians to be right, Jews have to be wrong. It's a zero sum formula. And so they will read the New Testament passages which originated in inner Jewish rivalry between Jesus and other groups of Jews that was intensified after the destruction of the temple by the gospel writers trying to have influence in Judaism in competition with other Jews post-temple. And that further exacerbated once the, ch uh, the church becomes an all Gentile operation and it's now we Gentiles who have, have the fullness of truth against those Jews who are stuck with their oral interpretations of the law which are now obsolete. And that's how the Pharisees come to have a bum rap. Historically, it's totally baseless but you can understand in the context of fighting, particularly when the church is in a weak and vulnerable position, the, excuse me, this is the kind of, um, of language that's going to appear. And I'll just ask you to look at one more passage because then Rabbi Skorka is gonna bring us up to the 21st century and, and where things stand today in this regard from the Catholic position. Now, in the, in the Catholic tradition, as you probably are well aware, just as Jews have their Parsha portions every week from the Torah, so Catholics have their portions of the gospel that are read over a three year cycle, not just a one year. And um, on certain Sundays or weekdays, there's also a, a schedule of weekday readings, some of the, the passages where Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees or like Matthew 23, whitewashed tombs and all that stuff, um, is the reading. And it's very easy for the preacher or the homilist just to fall back on that polemical idea and not critique it or not situate it in its historical context. And sometimes Pope Francis has done that. However, I wanna point out something really important about Francis's use of these texts. So look at this portion of a homily that he gave as a weekday, uh, at a weekday mass in the Vatican. And this is only a portion of the whole homily. I have heard several times of parish priests in Argentina who didn't want to baptize the children of the mothers because they were not born in a canonical or religious marriage. It was a civil marriage, not a church sacramental marriage. They shut the door. Why? Because the heart of these parish priests had lost the key to knowledge. 
Three months ago, in a country, in a city, a mother wanted to baptize her newly born son, but she was married civilly with a divorced man. The priest said, yes, yes, baptize the baby, but your husband is divorced, so he cannot be present at the ceremony. This is happening today, says Francis. The Pharisees, doctors of the law, are not people of the past. Even today, there are many of them. That is why we need prayers for us shepherds, us bishops, to pray that we do not lose the key to knowledge and do not close the door to ourselves and the people who want to enter, end quote. So what Francis will do, or has, has done, in the days when these readings are the, the selected text, is he will use the example of the Pharisees as legalistic, heartless implementers of regimen to criticize clericalism in the Catholic Church. Now, he never uses these texts to criticize Jews or to say, you know, following the Torah, that's silly, or something on net. In fact, he says quite the opposite, very forcefully. But by turning the sort of polemics of the New Testament against hypocrites and power-hungry clerics in the Catholic community, he's kind of perpetuating the image of the Pharisees that's kind of passed down in Western culture. So this was part of the background context for the conference that Rabbi Skorka and I participated in last May in Rome. And Rabbi Skorka will say more about this, but at the end of our conference, we all had an audience with Pope Francis who presented a text from his perspective about the Pharisees, and we'll say more about that. So, Rabbi Skorka, if you would. As Phil has just discussed, Christians use the figure of the Pharisees to caricature rabbinic Judaism as heartless and hypocritical legalism. In some Christian literature from the patristic period, second to sixth century CE, the same era as the classical rabbis. Rabbis and Pharisees were almost made synonymous. Many held that the Pharisees were the immediate forebears of the rabbis. The historical picture is somewhat more complex. In my presentation at the conference on Jesus and the Pharisees in Rome last May, I concluded that despite many cases in the Talmud where the teachings of the Perushim were seemingly accepted by the early rabbis, there are not enough definitive indications to allow us to conclude that one group is the continuation of the other. Nevertheless, many of the teachings of the Perushim were adopted by the rabbis since they maintained a certain spiritual vision that in contrast, in contrast with that of the Sadducees and other sects remained in many respects the view and vision of the Jewish people throughout the generations. What is important for us this evening is that the negative depiction of the Pharisees in the New Testament, for instance, as it was said in Matthew 23, showing them as totally opposed to Jesus, together with the identification of them with the Talmudic sages who shaped rabbinic Judaism, was a source of Christian polemic and hatred for Jews for centuries. This topic was so sensitive that one of the most important post nostraitate Vatican documents published in 1985 by the Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews entitled Notes on the Correct Way to Present the Jews and Judaism in Preaching and Catechesis in the Roman Catholic Church devoted a special section to the Pharisees. As we read, Jesus' relation with the Pharisees were not always or wholly polemical. Of this, there are many proofs. It is Pharisees who warn Jesus of the risks he is running. Jesus shares with the majority of Palestinian Jews of that time some Pharisaic doctrines. For instance, the resurrection of the body, forms of piety like almsgiving, prayer, fasting, 
and the liturgical practice of addressing God as Father, the priority of the commandment to love God and our neighbor. This is so also with Paul, who always considered his membership of the Pharisees as a title of honor. Paul also, like Jesus himself, used methods of reading and interpreting scripture and of teaching his disciples which were coming to the Pharisees to their time. This applies to the use of parables in Jesus' ministry as also the method of Jesus and Paulus of supporting a conclusion with a quotation from scripture. Point eight, it is noteworthy to that the Pharisees are not mentioned in accounts of the Passion. If in the Gospels and elsewhere in the New Testament there are all sorts of unfavorable references to the Pharisees, they should be seen against the background of a complex and diversified movement. Phariseeism in the pejorative sense can be rife in any religion. It may also be stressed that if Jesus shows himself severe towards the Pharisees, it is because he is closer to them than to other contemporary Jewish groups. This is a quotation from notes on the correct, correct way to present the Jews and Judaism in preaching and Catechesis in Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the, the second important document from the church after Nostra Aetate. More recently, Jesus and the Pharisees was chosen as the theme of the conference sponsored by the Pontifical Biblical Institute to celebrate the 110th anniversary of its founding. Phil and I were participants in the uh, in it, in last May, toward the end of the conference, we had an audience with Pope Francis who said to us as follows. I also greet the participants in the conference, Jesus and Pharisees, an interdisciplinary reappraisal, which addresses a specific issue important for our time and is a direct result of Nostra Aetate. The conference seeks to understand the at times polemical treatment of the Pharisees in the New Testament and in other ancient sources. In addition, it examines the history of scholarly and popular interpretations among both Jews and Christians. Among Christians, and in secular society in different languages, the word Pharisee often means a self-righteous or hypocritical person. For many Jews, however, the Pharisees are the founders of rabbinical Judaism and hence their own spiritual forebears. The history of interpretation has fostered a negative image of the Pharisees often without a concrete basis in the gospel accounts. Often over the course of time, that image has been attributed by Christian to Jews in general. In our world, sadly, such negative stereotypes have become, become quite common. One of the most ancient and most damaging stereotypes is that of a Pharisee especially when used to cast Jews in a negative light. This is the Pope. I am, re I am reading the Pope's words. Recent scholarship has come to realize that we know less about the Pharisees than previous generations taught. We are less certain about their origins and about many of the teachings and practices. Your conference's examination of interdisciplinary research into literary and historical questions regarding the Pharisees will contribute to a more accurate view of this religious group while also helping to combat anti-Semitism. End of the quote. This conference and the words of Pope Francis are a milestone in the new dialogue between Jews and Catholic that started with the proclamation of Nostra Aetate by the Second Vatican Council in 1965. 
And this is the way that the Jews and the and the Catholics are foreseeing the becoming steps in our relations to talk about these theological, theological issues, to analyze them from all the, and to try to understand them from all the point of view, of view. After several decades of building trust and learning how to speak together, we are now entering in a time of reconsidering and revising long-held theological and historical ideas about each other. The conference in Rome last May and the Pope's statement to it was undoubtedly an important step in this important task for both communities. Thank you so much. So let me summarize the questions as I was asked. So first, uh, this lady made the, uh, the insightful comment that um, the reference to loving your neighbor as yourself and that that is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices, that this is a prophetic theme that one finds in the Hebrew prophets. And you cited Amos and uh, Hosea says something similar. And so um, to me, that, that is further indication that Jesus is a Jew, right? He's talking within the Jewish milieu, you know, as tradition. So let me sum up your comments. Again, this lady is wondering if the Jewish aversion to try and bring non-Jews into the fold uh, stems from this time period. Uh, and she wonders if maybe the time has come for Jews maybe to try and missionize toward non-Jews. Do you want to comment on that? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, it I, is I, an I inner, have a little comment. It is an inner Jewish question, so uh, I, you know. In, in accordance to our sources, uh, essentially, uh, we are not missionaries. If you open the very simple, the last the Jewish codification, universally accepted, the Shulchan Aruch, in, uh, in Yoredea, appears that the first law is that when a non-Jew comes to a, to a rabbinic uh, a court asking, uh, saying, I would like to be a Jew, is a... Uh, I'm acting it out. <laughs> so so the, the, the answer of the rabbis has to be, what for? You are, what do you need to be a Jew? We are living in a, with, in, in a world that uh, many of the members of the world are hating us. And uh, what for? What for do you need to be a Jew? This is the first, uh, we have, the, the tribunal must be reluctant to accept, to accept a non-Jew into, uh, uh, into Judaism. Only if he insisted, okay, I would like to be, I know, uh, I would like to be uh, with all my heart part of the Jewish people, then yes, we accepted him, we accept him with, uh, with open arms. But, uh, this is this is what appears in our in uh, in our rabbinical text. Historically speaking, as far as I understand, were only certain mo moments in Jewish history where uh, the acceptance of known Jews as part of Judaism was uh, uh, was something common. But in in general speaking, uh, during the most of the um, Jewish history the position was uh, to accept, but not so easy. Not to make, um, uh, what is the word? Uh, to go and to convert? Proselytizing. So again, to summarize the question, Catholic and Jewish approaches to reading biblical texts are different. Therefore, uh, what kind of dialogue can be possible when Jews and Catholics are looking at sacred texts together? So um, how about I, I take an initial uh, stab at that on the Catholic side? Um, you're quite right that asking questions um, of our faith was not exactly the way that I was introduced to the Catholic tradition in the 1950s uh, in grammar school. 
Rather, we had the Baltimore Catechism, which gave us the questions and also the answers. And we memorized them, right? That was essentially it. I do want to say, however, that we're dealing with a tradition that's 2,000 years old, just like when we're talking about Judaism, elite rabbinic Judaism is also roughly 2,000 years old, and of course it goes back into the Hebrew Bible even further. I think one of the distinguishing features of Catholicism is actually the commitment to faith-seeking understanding, that at our best moments we are always to be questioning. And this is what we teach our students in theology courses. Theology is not catechesis. It is rather the faith and reason combining in order to illuminate our tradition. So um, I just wanted to make that little commercial for the Catholic tradition writ large. But specifically, a very important um, development occurred in 1943 in the Catholic tradition. This was when Pope Pius XII, this is in the middle of the Second World War and the Shoah and everything else, 1943, uh, issued a encyclical, an authoritative letter called Divino Afflante Spiritu. And in that, uh, that papal document, he required, and this is a radical change, he required that Catholic biblical interpretation must begin by setting the biblical text in the historical and literary context, which is what I did this evening when I looked at Matthew, for example. I didn't read Jesus' words in Matthew as direct quotes from Jesus in the 30s. I read them as Matthew presenting a Jesus in the context of his debate with the Pharisees in the 80s or 90s. That turn, it's, we'll call it biblical criticism, but it simply means biblical analysis or contextual readings. That now is mandated within the Catholic community. And the, the consequence of that for Catholic Jewish relations is we have to acknowledge, and in fact the Pontifical Biblical Commission and Pope Francis have acknowledged that Jewish interpretations and traditions of interpretation are perfectly reasonable and perfectly valid and perfectly worthy of study and understanding on the part of Catholics. So we can learn from Jews and their traditions of interpretation of the Tanakh or of the Hebrew Bible, and we hope that Jews can learn from our traditions of interpretation, although there's gonna be difference, it's not exactly a, there's differences there, it gets complicated. But my point is that once the Catholic community has made the turn that multiple legitimate interpretations of the text are possible, let's go at it. Let's, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but let, let, let's, let's get into it, I, I should say. And, and, and I'll just say one more thing and then see if Rabbi Skorka wants to add something. Um, that's the purpose of the sculpture that Elena projected earlier, Synagogue and Ecclesia in Our Time, which is a play on Nostra Aetate, a synagoga is sharing the Torah with her discussion partner, Ecclesia Church, who is holding open a Christian Bible. They're studying texts together in a Chavruta-like manner, which is the traditional rabbinic way of studying the Torah in pairs. Well, this is an interreligious Chavruta, and that's what we see as the, as the future of the Catholic Jewish relationship, and it's by the way, I will embarrass you, but this is also um, symbolized by the friendship of Rabbi Skorka with Pope Francis. They were dialoguing together for 20 years or so, long before anybody in North America had heard the name of Jorge Bergoglio. And that's a post Nostra Aetate reality, that you have bishops and rabbis who learn together. That's where we are. So a long-winded answer to a, a good question. The point is not only, um, I would say, an intellectual or a spiritual point. There are a practical dimension uh, to this dialogue. Um, the dialogue, first and foremost, um, has as one of its more important aims to produce a turning point in the relationships between Jews and Catholics, Jews, and the Christian world uh, in general. Um, 
because we have something very in common, which is the core of the Bible. Uh, we have a lot of values in common. We have a vision of the world and of the existence with a lot of points that we are sharing, those points. The article that impressed me a lot and convinced me when I was a rabbinical student to work in the dialogue is an article that I recommend for all of you in order to understand deeply what is the importance of the dialogue between Jews and Catholics, between Jews and Christians. The name of the article is No Religion is an Island, and the author of this article was Rabbi Avraham Yeshua Heschel. It's very, it's very easy to get this article. You can enter in internet that in PDF you have this article. It's an extraordinary article uh, written by one of the, of the rabbis, but the rabbi that involved himself in an extraordinary way in the production of Nostra Etate. Um, the other point is, uh, is this. Um, Christians and Jews uh, nowadays uh, are the descendants of those who were in the same womb 2,000 years ago in the Judea of uh, of the first century. Jews and Christians at the beginning were Jews, were Jews with different opinions. So as the Pope Francis says, if I would like to know exactly what I am as a Christian, I must know what means to be a Jew. Afterwards, we diverge in two different ways, but the core is the same. And the challenge is to uh, overcome all the, the problems, all the clashes we had in the past, and to create a reality in which really one can learn from the other. So the, the summary uh, of the question, um, it's a very interesting one. It's, uh, this lady was referring to the readings at a, a Sunday Mass not too long ago, where the first reading from the book of Exodus uh, has a God about to wipe out, or saying, I'm going to wipe out the Israelites because they've worshipped the golden calf. And then Moses persuades him to relent. Um, in the Gospel reading from Luke, it would be the parable of the prodigal son, where the younger son squanders away his inheritance and the, the prodigal father sort of welcomes him back uh, despite all the horrible things he's done. And um, the questioner was seeing a contrast which has been uh, a kind of typical Christian contrast over the centuries, which is the God of the Old Testament seems kind of harsh and judgmental and, and punishing, whereas the God of the New Testament seems to be loving and forgiving ad infinitum. So my take on your, there's a lot that could be said about this, <laughs> um, and you're dealing with a professor and we're, da you know, the, the danger of becoming pedantic is a real one. Um, but let me say this, the same, chapter in Exodus also, or the next chapter, I wish I have the text in front of me, the presence of God passes before Moses while he's hiding in a cleft in the rock. And a voice, presumably that of God or some supernatural source, yells out, uh, the Lord, the Lord, a God infinite in mercy and abounding in compassion. 
who punishes the second and third generation for the sins of their parents, but forgives up to the thousandth generation for those who follow God's word, or I'm paraphrasing now, but you get the idea. So the God of Israel's experience in the Hebrew Bible is really summed up in that beautiful exclamation from the heavenly voice or whomever it is, that God is above all known by Israel as a God whose love and compassion and chesed is, is infinite, is, is unbelievably generous. Well, that isn't so different from the God that Jesus speaks about in the parable of the prodigal son. The thing about the parable of the prodigal son, if I may say, that is kind of the hook, because Jesus' parables always have something to grab you, right? The thing about the prodigal son that's, that's a little different than, than the Exodus parallel scene or juxtaposed scene is the elder brother, right? The elder brother is ticked off because the father is giving a surle mignon dinner for the returning younger son and he complained, you know, you never even gave me a McDonald's gift certificate to go and have a... <laughs> Uh, a party with my friends. And the last words of the parable are the father saying to the elder son, my son, you've always been with me and everything I have is yours. But we ought to celebrate because this kid was as good as dead and now he's come back to life. What we do not learn from that parable is whether the elder brother joins the party or not. That's Jesus' ministry. Are you going, my listeners, Jewish, my Jewish kinsfolk, are you going to accept that the reign of God is imminent and is coming and is going to be a wonderful time for celebration? Or are you going to not join the party because you're not happy with everybody getting an invitation or something? Um, so anyway, that's, uh, again, lots and lots and lots could be said about these two texts. Thank you for for raising your question. I do think Christian preachers have to be careful about understanding the Hebrew Bible in its own frames of reference before leaping to uh, unflattering comparisons with the New Testament. I don't know, I'm sorry for the lesson. Oh, no, it's, uh, I, I am pedantic. It, 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 just one phrase more uh, in order to complete the idea. Uh, the God that uh, Jesus are referring to is the God of Israel. And the Torah that Jesus are referring to is, is our Torah, the Torah that we know on these days. Uh, so, um, and the interpretations of the Torah, uh, we have to, uh, to be very, very careful because in making this difference, saying that the God of the Old Testament is a God without rachamim, without mercy, and the God, uh, uh, the word love is a key word in the whole Jewish Bible. The way to approach God is through love. And a person that studies the, the rabbinic interpretation of, the, of our Torah, what uh, it's, uh, in Christianity is known, the Old Testament, uh, can see how much mercy the rabbis in the first century, second century, third century, developed a uh, in their interpretations of how to apply the laws of the Torah.
pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.